Uh, I'm uh, very happy to introduce Carl Leinsteiner from uh, Institute for Theoretical Physics in Madrid. He got his PhD from uh, TU Vienna, although he was doing his actual research as a doctoral student at CERN. He had several postdoctoral positions, including uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, TU Vienna. Uh, he was a CERN fellow for a couple of years and a C1 professor at Humboldt University before joining Madrid. Uh, he had a, a position at Ramon and Cajal Fellow uh, at uh, Madrid, and since 2008, he is a permanent uh, uh, scientist at uh, the Institute of Theoretical Physics in Madrid. So welcome, and uh, you may start. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody, and uh, thanks especially to Igor for organizing this uh, wonderful uh, uh, Zoom uh, in, uh, seminar series. It's really a great, great welcome distraction from <laughs> the ongoing crisis outside and helps to refocus on work and physics. Thanks a lot. Okay, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak here. So, the title of my talk is uh, The Golden Age of Chirality and, and Quantum Mechanics. Um, and that's a bit of a poetic title, and I, I guess me alone, I would not have been able to come up with this title. So, um, okay, uh -huh. okay. Um, so here's the outline of my talk. I start with an introduction where I, I want to explain a little bit how, how this title came to me. And, and then uh, I will be a little bit more technical, explain about the normalities in quantum field theory and the theory of a normalist transport and then discuss a couple of uh, realizations of the phenomena, which are known as chiromagnetic, chirovortical effect uh, in, in different physical setups, the core pure plasma, in condensed matter setup, uh, so-called wild semi-metals, and possibly if, if there's enough time, also in, um, in optics or in just Maxwell theory, just for hormones, okay? And then I give a summary and outlook. So, how does this title come about? Uh, in 2018, uh, there was a, a chiral fluid workshop organized by Andre Sadofiev in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And, and one day I was just looking what was going on at this workshop, who would be the speakers and so. And, and so I just searched for it on the internet and, and I Search for Carelity and Santa Fe, and assuming you know the only source of Carelity in Santa Fe could be our workshop, but it turns out that wasn't the case, and there was something very more popular, and and that's this page which you see now. That's uh, CormicMcCarthy.com, and the title was Carelity in McCarthy. So, so McCarthy, uh, you probably know, is uh, an American American writer. And here is one of his most uh, important books. It's called Subtree. Uh, and this book plays a lot with the theme of uh, mirror image. And if you want of chirality, so here I have, uh, if you want to read this, there are a couple of citations from this story. Uh, and so much so that there is a, a, a literary scientist uh, who is now a professor at Texas Tech University, uh, Brian Ginzer. I'm not sure if I pronounced his name correctly. And he wrote actually an article uh, called uh, Mirror Image Asymmetry, Chirality and Subtree. Uh, and that was published in the, in the special issue of the European Journal of American Studies. That's sort of interesting title. Uh, called Comic McCarthy Between the Worlds. There's a, uh, there was a special issue just on McCarthy and, and so this Brian Gein, so he, he, he worked on the theme of mirror image asymmetry and chirality in the work of Cormac McCarthy. And one of the things I, I read, so I downloaded this article, you can find it on the internet, and I downloaded it and I read it. And so one of the things he said uh, is, for now suffice it to say that we may be in something of a golden age of chirality from breaking bad to Nobel Prize winning areas of scientific inquiry. So I found this a very beautiful sentence and very uh, well fitting. Um, and I was asking myself, so what is this golden age of chirality? Of course, 
In Western art, apparently in literature, it's a big theme. And last year, last year I was uh, in Beijing before the Corona crisis, and I found this uh, work by uh, Imperial court painter Lin Liang, who lived from 1424 to 1500. And that painting uh, is precisely called Two Eagles. But I actually would like to rebaptize it uh, because if you look carefully, the eagles, you know, they, they uh, describe right-handed spiral. So this one is going up like this, but the other one is also, is also a right-handed one. So it's really a chiral eagle. And I'm not sure uh, how much this is intentionally, but anyway, that's certainly chirality in this, uh, also in Eastern art. And, and so what is, has Breaking Bad to do with this? Well, uh, that's a TV series, I guess most of you know it. Uh, and uh, there is this chemical which is called methamphetamine and it's chiral. And the left-handed uh, chemical, labor methamphetamine, is actually something you use probably very often in winter. Uh, it's a tie uh, against congestion, I guess. So I've, I've tried to avoid, you know, I've, I've tried to be careful with licensing and so on. So, uh, I did not put the brand, the particular, I just made a photo of myself with the stick in my nose. So that's what Lego methamphetamine is good for. And there is also the dextromethamphetamine, and this is called, this is crystal meth. So this is a terrible drug, and that's what this TV series is about, Breaking Bad. And the Nobel Prize he referred to is a Nobel Prize in chemistry by, I think, his Dutch Bernard Ferringer. And he got the Nobel Prize for the design and synthesis of, uh, and I inserted here chiral molecular machines. So what he's doing here is chiral molecules, shines polarized light on it and makes them move in specific ways. And, and there is a connection to what I will be talking about, uh, enantioselectivity, selectivity, how light interacts with small chiral molecules and that would lead us to a concept which is called silge. And of course, life by itself is chiral, uh, that's an RNA. The thing which keeps us all at home famously is an RNA virus. It doesn't have DNA, just RNA. Uh, and it's all chiral. So when did this golden age of chirality actually start? Well, as a physicist, of course, you can say, well, the golden age of chirality starts somewhere here. Because uh, our best physical theories are chiral gauge theories, the Sander model. So the world from the very onset on is a chiral world. And that's well known. Uh, so, but what, what I would like to talk about in, in the rest of the talk now is not so much about chiral uh, quantum field theories, but more about chiral states and what happens when you drive a not necessarily chiral theory into a chiral state and how anomalies can give rise to new transport phenomena and possibly how uh, we can find applications of this uh, new phenomenon. Okay, so let's go now to the physics. Um, what's an anomaly? Well, uh, we all know an anomaly happens when the uh, particular symmetry of a quantum mechanical system or a quantum field theoretical system is not compatible uh, with well, quantum theory with quantization. So the prime example of this or the oldest example is the theory of uh, fermions, uh, Dirac fermions, or here massless fermions. If the fermions are massless, then uh, the Hamiltonian, and I prefer to write under the Hamiltonian because it's really so simple. Uh, for chiral fermions, it's just given by the, the inner product of the, of the Pauli matrices times the momentum. And there are two unitarily inequivalent choices of, of hem such Hamiltonians. Let me, you can, you can write the plus or minus sign here. And this denotes chirality. So plus or minus is either right-handed and left-handed. And it means that the, the positive energy states, the particle states, have the spin either aligned with the momentum or anti-aligned with the momentum. And just to to distinguish this from a very related concept, but uh, it's, it's different, which is helicity, which is the projection of the spin onto the momentum. 
um, in order to define helicity, you need to have a well-defined momentum. And from quantum mechanics, we know when you have momentum well-defined, then you have a completely delocalized wave packet. And in fact, uh, as far as I know, the examples I know, everything which would be called helicity is always a sort of non-local quantity, whereas Carelli is a local quantity. And so, so you can locally measure how much chirality is at a point. And so for, for uh, the usual chirality of uh, fermions, you have this rho five, which is just psi dagger gamma five psi. Chiral density is just the number of left-handed fermions or right-handed fermions minus the number of left-handed fermions. And then we know from the late sixties of last century or millennium, uh, we know that uh, while classically this uh, chiral charge is conserved, the independent U1 symmetries, which allow you to rotate the phases of the wave function for the right-handed and left-handed fermions independently, uh, quantum mechanically, quantum mechanically, this is not anymore a symmetry. And there's this uh, adler belcher anomaly found in 1969 to explain the decay of the neutral pion into two uh, photons. And that, uh, so that says that in parallel external and magnetic fields, the uh, number axial charge is not conserved, but changes according to this rate here. Okay, it's so a little animation of a happy chiral fermion. And uh, so this is probably a little bit less known, uh, but actually in the same year, 1969, uh, Kimura in Japan uh, redid the same calculation of Adler, Bell and Shakif. And the only thing he did, he inserted here in this triangle diagram, not, uh, uh, so here's an actual an axial uh, current and here he didn't insert uh, electromagnetic currents or vector currents, he inserted energy momentum tensors. And he found that there's also a gravitational contribution to this axial anomaly, which takes this form and R is the Riemann tensor. So the meaning of this anomaly uh, is, is probably a bit more subtle. Um, so what it really says is, uh, it, it's actually a statement about quantum field theory in flat space. Also, it's most often expressed in this way, where you have a, a Riemann tensor sitting there, or the contraction of two Riemann tensors. Um, it's really a statement of, in, of quantum field theory in flat space. And it says that you cannot uh, define conserved energy momentum tensor and a conserved axial current at the same time as operators. So it's important to understand this as an operator relation. So it's not possible to define conserved energy momentum tensor and operator, which represents a conserved energy momentum tensor and the conserved axial current. There's no way to do this um, in the quantum theory. And that's a statement about, about uh, quantum field theory in flat space. Of course, you can, in, you can think of now about this curvature just being the metric and the metric, everything it does is, is just, it is a bookkeeping device for, for uh, telling you how many insertions of energy momentum tensors you generate in your correlation function. So it's a classical source. Of course, eventually you can make it, you can make the metric dynamical, like couple it to say, give it a dynamical term like Einstein term. And then if it's dynamical, it describes the decay of a neutral pion into gravitons, of course, something which is, which is very, very much suppressed. And we would never be able to see this effect in uh, say high energy physics, particle physics experiments. Okay, now let's, let's give it a little bit of pedestrian view on anomalies. Um, let's put these fermions in a magnetic field. And so Igor has written the definitive uh, review on magnetic fields, fermions in magnetic fields. Um, and so what happens is that the spectrum organizes in lambda levels. There are these higher lambda levels here with this uh, dispersion relation. They can only move along the direction of the magnetic field, which is denoted here by KZ. And, and I have not depicted in this picture here the higher lambda levels. They are just hyperpolar, which, which go like this. They don't do anything interesting. The interesting thing is uh, the, the uh, lowest lambda level, uh, so this is for a Dirac fermion. There is a right-handed and a left-handed uh, chiral fermion. And so there's also a, a normal ordered vacuum. We can think of, you know, according to Dirac, 
we can think of all the negative energy states to be occupied and then we apply this normal ordering procedure on our operators such that we will sub subtract implicitly the contributions from this normal ordered vacuum. And, and what happens now if we switch on in addition to the magnetic field and the electric field, the electric field will pump energy into the system. So if this is aligned with the magnetic field, it will accelerate these uh, fermions and it will sort of uh, pump energy into these, uh, to the right-handed fermions and extract energy or sort of try to break to make them slower. Of course, you cannot make them slower, but extract energy uh, from these uh, right-handed fermions. And so what's happening in the magnetic field is this, these guys get uh, drawn out of the vacuum and become real particles according to our definition of normal ordered vacuum. Whereas the other guys get pushed back into the vacuum and what we generate are uh, a bunch of holes. The total number is conserved, so the number doesn't change. Uh, the total number of uh, particles doesn't change, but the chirality changes because if we, if we generate these holes, right-handed holes or left-handed holes, they have the opposite chirality, so we change uh, the, uh, the chiral charge. Okay, so that's the spectral flow, well-known spectral flow argument for the anomaly. And, and so let's stay a little bit with the magnetic field and let's assume now that uh, we have a state in which uh, the, the electronic or the fermionic states are not only filled until the normal ordered vacuum, but they are filled to some higher le uh, level, some Fermi level, some denoted here by chemical potential mu. So if this happens, then uh, in the vacuum or uh, in this state, all these guys are uh, a field and we can compute how many, how many states there are. And since these guys, these guys, they don't contribute anything to the current, but these guys, they all move with the speed of light and they move with the same uh, velocity and in the same direction. So if you just count the number of particles here, we get automatically a current. And so the current, the number current, the particle current of these chiral fermions is given by just integrating the density of states in this one dimensional momentum space, which is the lowest lambda level from the normal ordered vacuum up to the Fermi level. And that's just mu divided by two pi. And since it's a four dimensional system, we have to multiply this with the degeneracy of the lowest uh, lambda level, which is uh, the number of states per unit volume given basically by the magnetic flux through per unit area, through the area. So then you get that the current there is automatically a current generated in the magnetic field, which is determined just by the chemical potential and by the magnetic field up to some factors of two pi. Now you can imagine that you have many of such chiral fermions. And so each chiral fermion comes with its own U1 charge. You can give it a flavor quantum number. And now you can ask yourself uh, in the flavor quantum number, you, you number this, you call them symmetry A, symmetry B, symmetry C. And, and you give each symmetry, uh, for each of these flavor symmetries, you, you uh, prescribe a, a state with a certain given chemical potential. You invent yourself a, a magnetic field that uh, couples only to the fermions which are charged under the symmetry number C. And then you, you ask how much current in the symmetry current number A is generated. And then you find there is a simple coefficient which determines this and it's this coefficient, which is just the triple product of the charges of the right-handed fermions minus the triple product of the charges of the left-handed fermions. And this, this is a very, very well-known object in quantum field theory. That's the anomaly coefficient. So that tells you if the symmetries have an anomaly. If this is non-vanishing, then you have uh, an anomaly in, in these currents, in these currents uh, which generate the symmetries A, B, C. Okay, so this is the first hint that this has something to do with anomalies. And, and you can repeat this exercise and calculate also the energy current here for a right or left-handed fermion. And you find again, there is a contribution which is proportional to the chemical potential. And there's a second contribution which is proportional to the uh, temperature. And here I've already written it as a chiral vortical effect. So here the calculation is done assuming that these fermions rotate with an angular velocity uh, given by omega. So it turns out that 
the lowest order, you can always have an effect in magnetic field and you just substitute the magnetic field by twice the vorticity and you find an effect uh, of vorticity. So there's an, uh, well, actually, I guess this is not completely correct. I'm sorry. Now there should be a magnetic field. I'm sorry. There should be a magnetic field here. Sorry. Uh, I made a mistake now. That's really a magnetic field here. Okay. So we have already, and you can do the same exercise. So uh, in this uh, term, which is quadratic in the magnetic, in the, in the chemical potential, you always find this coefficient, which determines if there is an anomaly. And uh, if you look to the coefficient, which goes like T squared with the temperature, you find also an, an, a coefficient, a coefficient which is typical of an anomaly. And the coefficient is precisely the one of this gravitational anomaly. So that suggests that uh, every time you see a mu in these expressions, it has something to do with the usual anomaly. And every time you see a, a T, it has something to do with this gravitational anomaly. So there are a couple of properties which make these currents very special. They are dissipationless, so they don't generate entropy and they don't have any quantum corrections. So by quantum corrections here, I mean that so this, it's like in the anomaly itself. So a good explanation of what this means is that the, to the anomaly diagram, there are no contributions coming from internal lines. Of course, there can be contributions of the uh, renormalization of the external lines. So these, these are effects, wave function renormalization of the external lines that, that you can have. So, sorry, that's just jumping to, okay. Um, and they're really dissipationless. So, so here's this uh, cartoon uh, of the quantum skier, this you have seen probably, and these chiral fermions in a magnetic field, they really do this. So, so there's an obstacle in front of them, but the chiral fermion uh, just goes around this because it has no degree of freedom for backscattering. It can only forward scatter. So there's an absolute negative uh, interference between backscattering for going once around the tree like this and once around the tree like that. And that immediate, that uh, ex, uh, uh, has neg uh, perfect negative interference. So the, the, the cardinal fermion can only go forward. Um, okay. Yeah, so. So can we derive this directly from the anomalies? So, uh, and one way of doing this is a little bit inspired from uh, what we've learned in holography. And that's uh, extending the uh, idea of effective actions to anomalies. But uh, it's a little bit different now. Uh, the point is that the anomaly is, uh, comes from a non-local contribution in the effective action of the fermion. So imagine you have done uh, the path integral over all your fermions and then you have generated an effective action which depends on external fields which now are say the gauge fields which couple to the currents, conserved currents or classically conserved currents and the metric uh, coupling to the energy momentum tensor. Uh, but if you, if you uh, generate this by just integrating over the fermions that is necessarily a non-local expression. And the anomaly by itself famously is local. So the gauge variation or the symmetry variation of this non-local effective action is a local term. So we cannot write down uh, a simple local effective action, but famously the anomaly can be written as a local term in one higher dimension. So if you're in five, in four dimensions, we can write a local anomaly term in five dimensions and use this as an effective action. And these are, of course, these John Simons terms. And, and so here I have the John Simons term for the usual chiral anomaly. A, these are all the same uh, gauge fields. And if you do a gauge variation, you just find that that's a total derivative. And you would first ju just find an expression, which is the chiral anomaly on the boundary of this five dimensional manifold. And something very, very similar is happening to the, uh, to the uh, Riemann term to the gravitational anomaly, which can also be written as a, as a, a five-dimensional uh, John Simons term. And uh, there are two contributions. You have to be a little bit more careful. That's a contribution which uh, is uh, proportional to the extrinsic curvature. And that's not the true anomaly because that actually is a, a well-defined tensor from the four-dimensional point of view. And, and that will play an important role. Uh, so now, 
of course, we have the action, but what I emphasize so far is we need the state because in order to find this current, you know, we need it to evaluate the uh, expectation value of the current and the energy current, the energy momentum tensor, in a particular state, a tunnel state. So how do we represent the state in which the system is, the equilibrium state, in our effective theory, which I said now just to be this John Simons, five-dimensional John Simons theory. And, and so what you want is you want a five-dimensional metric. Um, so here I have a five-dimensional metric. It should have the symmetries of the theory, which is if you had finite temperature, you have a tunnel circle, and then you have just flat space. So here's flat space. But then here's the metric element for the S1. And then you want this geometry to be smooth. So there are some arbitrary functions, f and g, which you can write down. You don't need to know anything about these functions. But one thing is important. If you want this to be a regular geometry, then in the interior of the geometry, and you want this geometry only to have one boundary, then this function f has to shrink to zero, so such that this s1 here goes to zero size at the origin, say at r equals zero. And the derivative of this function is fixed to the periodicity. If this doesn't happen, then you would have a conical singularity, but we don't want that. We want this space to be smooth. And if you want this space to be smooth, then the derivative of this function f is uniquely tied to the periodicity of the circle, which again is the uh, inverse temperature. So the derivative here at the origin is determined by what we would call the temperature. And in this picture, the field theory lives here on the boundary. So, of course, we don't know this function to f and g, but the topology of this geometry is actually the one of the five-dimensional black hole. That's the Euclidean section of a five-dimensional black hole. And so, can we, can we use now John Simon's section on this five-dimensional black hole and calculate some response functions? And the answer is yes. So we can take just our John Simon's term for the gauge fields here, and we can vary it with respect to the gauge field, and the variation with respect to the gauge field couples to the current. So <clears throat> there are two contributions you find. There is one contribution, which is just a boundary contribution, and there is a second contribution, which is a bulk contribution. So we need to evaluate this bulk contribution of this John Simon's term. But it turns out that under the condition that we want this thing to be uh, uh, equilibrium state, which means it should be time independent, it should have a magnetic field, and it should have something which we can interpret as a chemical potential that uniquely determines the field configuration, this F, which we have to plug in, and it takes this form. And F0R is sort of an electric field which points in this, uh, in this additional fifth dimension, and we can identify its boundary value with the chemical potential if we want. And then if we evaluate both terms from the first part, we get this answer. We get a, a current. So this part gives us a current, which is six times the chemical potential times the magnetic field. But we also get a contribution from this term, and that gives minus two times the chemical potential and the uh, magnetic field. Now this term, for this I don't need to know anything about the bulk field configuration. So what really represents here equilibrium is this, because here I have to put additional information into, into my theory that I'm in thermal equilibrium. And only then, time independence, only then I can evaluate this uniquely. And so if you put in, say, the normalization for the uh, anomaly of one chiral fermion, it's 1 over 24 pi squared. And from this expression here, you find the usual uh, Term, which we had before, which is 1 over 4 pi squared times the magnetic field, but you find a second contribution from here. And, and uh, for those who know this already, um, so these two contributions, they are known in the literature. So this is called the covariant current, and this is the so-called bardeen sumino current, and both together are the so-called consistent current. So you need, generically, you need both. And in equilibrium, they are uniquely defined. Okay. So you can derive this just from an effective action approach, making assumptions, uh, reasonable assumptions uh, about field configurations, which represent thermal equilibrium and evaluating the John Simons term. And so you can also do this, this was just for one chiral fermion, but you can take two chiral, a left-handed and a right-handed uh, fermion, 
and construct a, a, a VA theory with a vector symmetry and an axial symmetry. And you can demand that the anomaly sits only in the axial uh, symmetry. Then there's a unique form of the uh, John Simons term, which does this, is this one. So where you have just uh, here, this is the vector field strength, the field strength uh, of the gauge field that couples to the usual current, say the electric current, and that would be the gauge field for the axial uh, current. And then you do the same trick. And you can do two calculations. One is uh, calculating how much vector current, or let's say electric current, you get. And in exact equilibrium, where you can have this exact field configuration, you find that the result is zero. And there's a precise cancellation of the bulk term against the boundary term. Whereas, and this is the kind of magnetic effect, uh, and this is the statement, uh, which is now known as um, the Bloch theorem, uh, that uh, exactly conserved currents have to vanish in exact equilibrium. And this is what I've put in, so exact equilibrium, and my result here is that this vector current has to vanish. Um, uh, but uh, if you do the same calculation for the chiral separation effect, you ask how much uh, axial current is generated by a, a vector chemical potential in the chemical potential in the vector symmetry in a magnetic field, then you find there's no boundary contribution and you just find this result. And so this, this, this axial current evades this Bloch theorem simply because it's not a conserved current anyway. It's the one which has the anomaly, whereas in the construction I used, in the particular effective action I used with John Simon's term, the vector current was explicitly uh, broken, uh, explicitly conserved, sorry. Okay, so, and now you can do the same thing and ask what's happening to the gravitational anomaly. And so one thing you can do is you can ask how much current is generated by rotation and you can represent rotation by just a rotating black hole. So this is the metric by a slowly rotating five dimensional black hole, omega. So that, that's supposed to represent a slowly rotating, that the uh, slowly rotating uh, fermion gas, say, or chiral theory with uh, this particular gravitational anomaly. And you can evaluate the John Simons term and find the current. And the current picks up a contribution which is just proportional to the derivative of this function f in front of this warp function f in front of the, this uh, time component of the metric at the horizon. So you evaluate this in the Lorentzian signature and you argue that everything on the boundary, which is the field theory which, uh, which uh, interests you, can see stuff only from the horizon until to the boundary. And so that picks up this term then from the horizon. And as I said before, for this background geometry without the rotation, for this geometry to be, to be regular, this uh, derivative of the function, technically speaking, of the surface gravity of the black hole is tied to the period, which is the, of the Euclidean circle, which is the temperature. So you find a physically interpretable result that rotation of chiral fermions due to the gravitational anomaly generate a current in this way. So that's the chiral uh, vertical effect and the temperature contribution from the, from the uh, gravitational anomaly. So that has been, okay. So <clears throat> one way I like to think about this is uh, a generalization of what uh, Luttinger was doing in 1964. So in 1964, uh, actually before people knew how to compute transport coefficients like um, electric conductivity by correlation functions of uh, in quantum theory like current current correlation functions and they knew that in particular kinematic limit uh, it would generate uh, the uh, the electric conductivity green kuber so these are called green kuber formulas um, and so Luttinger asked, how do we do this for thermal transport? And so he used the result from, from uh, general relativity, which tells you there's a, in a gravitational field, there's a redshift in energy if you go up uh, the gravitational field. Uh, and uh, if you imagine that you have a, 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 some, uh, some system at finite temperature in a gradient of a gravitational field, then 
uh, since the energy gets redshifted, it effectively means that the effective temperature gets redshifted. So well, that was known already in general relativity, and I think that's called the local Tolman temperature. Um, but Luttinger realized that you can actually use this uh, to compute thermal transport uh, coefficients. So everything you have to do is you have to put your system in a gravitational field, theoretically, and then compute correlation functions by differentiating with respect to the gravitational field and generate uh, the correlation functions which give you thermal transport coefficients. And so what, of course, now we are, you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, I think now everything has to be called quantum. So there's a lot of quantum materials uh, which have topological properties where quantum theory, where wave functions of electrons in the materials are non-trivial fiber over the brilliance on, et cetera. So there's, uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, physics going on there. And uh, there are a lot of quantum transport effects like quantum Hall effect or quantum thermal Hall effect. And so in order to understand this quantum thermal transport, it's reasonable then not just to, to use ideas from gravity, but actually use ideas from quantum gravity. And one of these ideas is to put the theory in a black hole and study the effects of, if you want, Hawking radiation and interpret them again in terms of thermal transport uh, coefficients of non-trivially non-trivial topological states of matter. So that's a, a nice intuitive way of thinking about this. So I, um, so there is there is so in condensed matter this is uh, partially well known and partially also not so well known and possibly sometimes also rejected. Uh, but here's uh, a famous condensed matter physicist Charlie Kane, and I explicitly ask him before if I'm allowed to use this slide. That's a slide of his in a talk he gave at the uh, Simon Center. Uh, he talks about topological insulators. So these are states which are uh, materials which have a bulk gap and there are chiral edge states. We have chiral fermions here is this chiral edge state, conduction band, valence band, they're filled in the bulk, that's nothing. And these guys have a quantized thermal conductance, which is given by this. And, and he states in his talk, that comes from the gravitational anomaly. Okay, so, so can, we, can we understand this from the theory of effective uh, uh, actions with just simply being John Simon's terms? And it turns out, yes, we can do that. So what I do here is uh, I consider such a, what is called a churn insulator. In the bulk, there is actually no degree of freedom. So we can simply think the theory to be at zero temperature, but <clears throat> it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive uh, fermion I say a two plus one dimensional fermion. These are two plus one dimensional systems, two space dimensions. And if this fermion is massive, we can integrate out the fermion and generate an effective action. Hence now this is massive, the effective action is local. If we couple it to a metric, we generate a John Simons term of the metric, which describes the bulk theory with a gravitational anomaly coefficient, which describes the gravitational anomaly on the boundary. But on the boundary, we have this chiral, uh, fermion. And so my idea is to describe also the effective action or the anomalous part of the effective action of the chiral fermion by John Simon's term, exactly the same John Simon's term, but now on a fiducial, on an imaginary black hole metric, which represents the thermal state. <coughs> this, of course, the boundary of the black hole is again just this line here where the chiral edge uh, fermion lives. And the full theory shall be, of course, anomaly free. And that means that this coefficient has to cancel precisely the anomaly from this coefficient. So this coefficients of the John Simon's terms are related by this. So that is what is called bulk boundary correspondence in this picture, in the, in the theory of topological insulators, and topological gap states of matter. And then you can calculate how much current you get from here. And you find again this T squared current and you can calculate the thermal conductivity and it's just written here in a slightly different way. So of course in the equilibrium again you get zero because uh, there's you know every material has two edges at least and there's one edge where the current is going up and another edge where the current is going down. So if you just take a cross section there's as much current going up as it's going down. But if you heat this guy a little bit up to a little bit higher temperature then you have more upgoing uh, energy current or heat current than downgoing and you will see that there is a, a temperature gradient across this sample and a net uh, heat current which goes orthogonal to it. So that explains, so that's uh, explanation of the thermal Hall effect. And it's actually exactly the same theory you can apply to this as you can apply to chiral magnetic effect 
and chiral vortical effect. Let me also say there is a, uh, another approach uh, to this thermal effects, uh, which is based on, on a global anomaly. So that's even a more complicated, more exotic anomaly, where you have to put the theory on some complicated manifolds, which on some fluxes and so on. There's some, some group which makes some non-trivial uh, global uh, twists on these two circles. That's a thermal circle and that's a residual uh, space-like circle. And the, these Kyler theories we are talking about, they have global anomalies, which means that even if you do a twist, which brings this manifold back to itself, the addition function doesn't go back to itself, but only up to a base. And uh, this coefficient here, it actually also uh, fixes uh, the, this chiral vortical effect. It doesn't fix it completely because the global anomaly is, is a phase. And of course, a phase is determined only up to some in, uh, multiples of two pi. So it, it fixes some fractional part of this. And there is some, still some riddle about this, for me, Gravitinos, which are spin three, are relativistic spin three half particles, where at least the argument I presented, it does not really work. So, uh, so uh, whereas this global anomaly does, uh, gives, gives the right coefficient there. Also, as far as I know, uh, the global anomaly gives the right coefficient up to two pi only in certain cases, like anti-symmetric tensor fields in six dimensions and so So that I think this is still not 100% understood and there's still some theory to be worked out. Okay, let me now go to applications. Um, so first the core gluon plasma, then white semi-metals, and finally I want to talk about just uh, good old phonons. Uh, I guess that here in this audience, I don't have to introduce a lot of uh, core gluon plasma physics because most of the people in the, who are listening, who are still listening, um, will know more about this than me. So here's the picture of Rick. This is LHC in Geneva. Um, I should be the least detector. I hope it is the least detector. Yeah. Uh, so that's the uh, idea of the chiromagnetic effect. As, uh, by Fukushima, worked out Fukushima, Katsiev, McLaren, and Fukushima, Katsiev, and Waringa. And so the idea is that you have uh, collisions of these uh, heavy ions. Lead, I think, at the LHC and gold uh, at the originally at the at RIC. And, and so these are very heavy ions. They collide, but they don't collide just head on. They just have this sort of grazing collision and there's a central part left over which is a hot fireball and uh, produces the core gluon plasma, deconfined state of quarks and gluons. Um, and, and, but since the, the spectators which do not collide, they're positively charged, <coughs> they generate a strong, <coughs> they generate of course, an, excuse me, <coughs> sorry, an electric current. And that electric current in turn will generate a strong magnetic field perpendicular to this reaction plane. Uh, and this magnetic field is one of the, or probably the most, the strongest magnetic field in the universe. It lives for a very short time, but it's very, very strong. And now the idea is that there is actually the, uh, the uh, QCD part of the axial anomaly. And so in the early stages, there are very strong non-equilibrium excitations of gluon fields and they might excite this topological term, which excites the anomaly, and that might flip chiralities of the quarks. And so if this happens, then that uh, quark gluon plasma enters equilibrium or near equilibrium or hydrodynamization or whatever in a state which is a chiral state, which has more left-handed and right-handed fermions, or more right-handed and left-handed fermions. Of course, that would be randomly distributed because there is no actual source of chirality here. It's just randomly distributed by this gauge field fluctuation, by this gluon field fluctuations. So on average, there's no chirality, but if you look event by event, there might be some chirality. And if there's chirality, and if this thing can be described by the term ensemble, then there should be a chiral magnetic effect. And in this case, uh, this formula is slightly different. I told you there were these two contributions. But the second contribution that came from assuming that the axial gauge field, the temporal component of the gauge field is equal to the chemical potential. Now that is an assumption which is valid only if you're in strict equilibrium, mathematical equilibrium, I would say. 
mathematical equilibrium and so forth, you can derive theorems about it, but it's probably not a very interesting state from physics because uh, if something is a true equilibrium, we cannot talk about it. <laughs> There's always a certain amount of non-equilibrium involved here. Yeah? And so in this non-equilibrium situation, this second part is not there and you only get one part to this contribution and it's just this one. So you get this kind of magnetic uh, effect. And so a popular way of, of describing also this non-equilibrium uh, uh, evolution possibly is via the ADS-CFT correspondence, where you assume that, uh, you, okay, you cannot model the strongly coupled uh, QCD plasma, but you do uh, probably something slightly different and hope that it's sort of in the same universality class, you model the strongly coupled N equals four plasma, which you can do by the help of this ADS-CFT uh, conjecture, um, you know, that's the way how a physicist, theoretical physicist describes complicated objects in nature. And so yeah, as theoretical physicists, if we are presented with this complicated object in nature, we model it by this. And uh, of course, there's this famous example of the Xi viscosity to entropy ratio, which turns out to be a very good description of the actual experimental data. So can you do this also for far from equilibrium? In equilibrium, of course, you just generate the formula I said before, you find that J is the current is proportional to this axial chemical potential and the magnetic field, but what's happening far from equilibrium? And, and one way of, of doing this, uh, so there are several people who address this, uh, but we recently, we did uh, some studies where we used what is called Vaidia metrics. These are metrics which you have nice control over it, there's some infalling null dust and what there's this blackening factor which determines the mass and charge of the black hole of this five dimensional ADS black hole. And you can make it time dependent in basically an arbitrary way. So that's morally speaking the mass, the charge. And so you can do this and then you can switch on a magnetic field and ask <coughs> what's happening to the current magnetic field if you are not just in a static black hole background, but where the black hole becomes suddenly very much larger, where it has higher temperature, heats up and so on. So we did numerical experiments on that and that's the result. So these are different curves. Tau is the time scale uh, for this uh, variation, for this non-equilibrium quench, uh, how, long, how long this uh, quench takes, how fast uh, we bring the state from a non-equilibrium to the new equilibrium state. But as the ADS via geometry apparently equi equilibrates sort of uh, instantaneously, the current magnetic effect does not. It takes a certain time. So here you see this is the, if this would be a perfect equilibrium uh, uh, evolution, if the current magnetic effect always would follow just the formulas of hydrodynamics, but it doesn't. The faster you change the temperature of the black hole, uh, the more delay you have. So there is a certain delay of, for the buildup of the current magnetic effect. Of course, eventually it always reaches a new equilibrium uh, value, which is well described by hydrodynamics. So the lesson from this probably is that if you're far from equilibrium, uh, you probably have to take this into account. And, and so when I talk to experimenters, which doesn't happen so, happen so <laughs> only once in a while, but um, so the last, things I, I heard is that, for example, people at LHC, when they look for CME, they say, well, actually everything is consistent with just background and there's no signal. Uh, whereas people at Rich say, well, that signal is not 100% explainable by just background. There's some residual CME background. And so I was, that's probably a key why this could be like this, because as I told you, the magnetic field is very strong, but it's also very short lived. So at the LHC is actually shorter, the lifetime of the magnetic field is shorter than a drick. So if at LHC the uh, magnetic field, so the, the magnetic field is somewhere here and the out of equilibrium stage goes very, very fast such that the CME takes its time to really uh, realize itself, then the magnetic field might be already gone before the theory is sufficiently close to equilibrium to have significant CME. But as a drake where the lifetime of the magnetic field is longer, it could be that uh, it still captures 
the magnetic field still lingers on at the time where the uh, plasma generated or the fireball generated at Rick is already sufficiently close to equilibrium to build up a significant CME current. So that, that's a lesson probably which you can draw from this. Of course, the final verdict on CME at, at uh, core gluon plasma will, uh, will hopefully be out soon from the ease of our run. So probably some of you knows more about that. Uh, okay, and now in the last five minutes, uh, I want to talk about wild semi-metals. So let me skip this. So what's a wild semi-metal? That's a complicated uh, material. Here's the band structure of what is called thallium arsenide. It's very complicated. Uh, here's the Fermi level. And what's interesting for us is that here these bands, they touch and here there's a little region where it's inverted and here it's uh, the other way around. So if you make a blow up of this little region, you see something like this. And it turns out that these intersections here, they locally uh, are chiral fermions. They behave like chiral fermions. So the sides are left-handed and the right-handed. And famously, in such a crystal, uh, the fermions, the electrons, always have to come in pairs of left and right, according to the theorem by Mies and Nina Mia. So you can apply the theory of anomalous transport. <coughs> and the first thing is, if you're in exact equilibrium, which means that the chemical potentials have equilibrated here, you're precisely in this situation, which I alluded to before, where you have these two contributions. This time, in wild semi-metals, you can also have this effective axial gauge field, this temporal component. If, if you take both combinations, both terms into account, then indeed you find that in equilibrium, there is no kind of magnetic effect in this uh, materials. So you have to drive the system slightly out of equilibrium. And so in order to understand non-equilibrium physics and how this works, uh, time scales are important. And so this is a cartoon which I took from Jan Zahnen. He was actually interested in the right hand part uh, where electrons interact very strongly and develop collective flow and hydrodynamic flow. We are interested more in the traditional metallic part where electrons, most of the time they don't do anything except they collide from time to time with an impurity. So there is a hierarchy of, of, of uh, time scales. The first is called inner valley scattering time, which means that an electron collides with an impurity and it doesn't change its chirality. It just stays in the same wild cone. Like here's the uh, schematic picture. So electron is scattered here, but it doesn't scatter over there and change would change chirality. Then there are rare occasions where the electron scatters very hard and changes chirality and jumps over there. And then there's another time scale where the electrons actually talk to each other. So now the approximation I will do from now on is I will take this inner valley scattering time um, to zero and this electron electron interaction time to infinity. And I will only keep this time scale, which means that due to inter valley scattering, the electrons in one uh, wild cone, they basically terminalize because they get randomly distributed in phase space. Uh, on the time scale, which is the inner valley scattering time. And then when they are randomly distributed, I might describe them by a thermal distribution determined by temperature and chemical potential. And only at a later time, the two wild cones equilibrate between each other. And so if you, if you set up this uh, particular hierarchy of time scales, and then you ask what's happening if you apply parallel electric and magnetic fields, then you generate by the anomaly, these are behave like chiral fermions, so they have an anomaly, you generate chirality, but on a time scale of tau five, it's cut off. So you, you eventually will reach a steady state where the number, where the chiral density is determined by how much external field you apply, E and B. And you can remodel that and ask how much current is generated by the chiral magnetic effect, and you find this famous negative uh, magnetoresistivity. And that's the famous plot from this uh, probably first paper on zirconium pentatelluride, which did these measurements and in, in fact defined this nice quadratic uh, behavior. It's supposed to become linear for higher magnetic fields because this, which is the relation between chemical potential and actual axial charge, that becomes also linear. It's basically just lowest lambda level physics at large magnetic fields. But you can also do this for the coupled uh, thermal or coupled energy and charge transport, and you can make the same assumption. So. And then you have uh, also a term which is served by a gradient of temperature, which comes from this term, which we discussed before. And then you find a term 
a conductivity which is just an electric conductivity and you find a thermoelectric conductivity in the, which also shows a, uh, a characteristic enhancement in a magnetic field. And so you can work out this theory. It's a bit more complicated. It's just coupled charge and energy transport. And the prediction is up. Okay, sorry, I forgot. A keynote has, I don't know, it crashes on this particular slide. I don't know why. Well, there is something I about it. I forgot that I should not, should not, let me see. I hope I can, yeah. Sorry for that. Okay, I go okay, to that slide and I don't touch it. Everybody else, uh, if you have any questions, prepare them. Do you see the slide? Not yet. I probably skipped that slide because it doesn't work anyway. So, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you see my slide now? Not yet. Okay. Now it should be on. Yep, everything's yeah, fine. Okay, okay. So I go to the. So this was a different paper. So uh, the, the the experiment is actually repeatable. So you can do this in different materials. This is a recent paper, uh, which also sees they actually measure directly the electronic thermal conductivity, where the gradient of the temperature is parallel to the magnetic field, and they also see this characteristic enhancement. The only thing is they don't like to attribute it to gravitational anomaly, they call it the thermal chiral anomaly. So, but qualitatively, at least this is consistent with what you would expect from this theory. And then uh, chiral optics, I don't know, I'm pretty much out of time. So shall I go through this? It's two slides or shall I just skip it? Igor? Um, feel just free to choose any way you prefer. It's, it's really up to you. Okay. So just because I made this distinction between chirality and helicity. So here's where it plays a big role. Um, helicity of Maxwell theory is well known. So it's, uh, now it works, it's this term here that's called magnetic helicity. You can generalize it by something like electric helicity. So that's a dual field strength center and that's the dual potential. So the kernel of the C field would be the, the uh, electric field, not the magnetic field. And if you take this, uh, you find that classically this thing is uh, conserved, but quantum mechanically this thing has an anomaly and that is called helicity. The problem with this expression is that it's not gauge invariant. It has actually two gauge uh, symmetries and it's not local because A and C are non-locally related to each other by some differential equation. So uh, you cannot say how much chirality is in a given uh, point or in a given volume and there is actually a different quantity which was discovered in 66 by Lipkin and it's called silch. And silch is uh, American uh, for, basically it means good for nothing. It's because Lipkin didn't know what it's good for. And that stayed like this until 2010 when Cohen and Tang argued that's actually the thing which measures how uh, photons or, chiral or, or polarized light interacts with small chiral molecules. So it measures chiral, the interaction of, of light with small chiral molecules. And so you can ask them, take this chiral, this silch, or this optical chirality, which is locally well-defined measure and ask, is there also a chiral vortical effect? So you just rotate a, a cylinder and fill it with a gas, heat it up, fill it back, basically rotating back body radiation. And you find indeed there is a silch current, a, a silch vortical effect. Uh, okay. And again, it seems to have to do something with gravitational anomalies, but this is still theory to be worked out, not completely clear. So that's it. I hope I could show you that there is an interesting rich uh, phenomenology of anomaly induced transport uh, phenomena. There are many more things I could not discuss. For example, these axial magnetic fields in wild semimetals, which can be produced by strain. So you can probe several things of anomalies which you cannot do in high energy physics because there are no axial gauge fields that would directly couple to the axial current. Uh, there are new uh, collective excitations like this current magnetic wave. There are also effects of the conformal anomaly. There's this helicity versus chirality which recently has been investigated further. And there's also uh, a series of papers talking about how torsion 
uh, acts on chiral filaments, and probably there's some anomaly involved. And finally, a recent, uh, last year, there was this idea of Carcia and Lee that you might use this, since these are dissipationless currents, you might use it to, to build something like a qubit and, and have a basis for a quantum computer. So I think, for me, that means that we are indeed coming into a new golden but anomalous age of chirality. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was very nice. We are indeed in the golden age, one way or the other. <laughs> uh, we do have question, at least one question so far. So, uh, Masood Chokri, you want to ask yourself? Uh, go ahead, please ask. Hi. Uh, Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes I hear you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. My question is about the role of electric field, the quarkum plasma. Yeah. Because I, yeah. I see that uh, almost every uh, thing that I have read about the CME uh, hunting in the quarkum plasma is based on the idea that the electric field is not present but it seems that uh, it is not a good approximation because the electrical conductivity of the, elect uh, the, of the quarkum plasma from lattice QCD is not that large. Uh, at least uh, if you compare it with the time and length scale and therefore the electric field is not suppressed, probably, I, I, I think so. And if that is not suppressed on each event and this Chiral phenomena is an event by event effect. Uh, and again, the electric field is also in, present in event by event. So if you are looking for the charge separation, maybe the electric field, the electric, the ohmic current is ne needed to be uh, considered at least as a background effect. Uh, I, I don't know if there is any uh, look into the CME in this context that takes that uh, electric field serious. Thanks. Yes. Okay, so uh, I have presented only, I think, the most basic picture of this. Of course, uh, I agree. I, I mean, eventually, uh, uh, one would need to do a full uh, magneto hydrodynamic simulation, I guess, with dynamical electric magnetic fields or, or probably also take external electric fields into account. Uh, I'm not a, a up to date, so I don't really know what's the status of such simulations and of such uh, considerations in respect to the core clone plasma. Probably somebody, Igor, probably you know more about well, this. Well, the, there is a point about the electrical conductivity, but I don't think there are sort of definitive answers to those questions, so. I, I don't think I'm, I'm aware of any clear answers. Well, um, I guess, uh, Masur, uh, do we move on or you have any, anything con to continue because we have the next question coming up if, if you are satisfied with that? Uh, yeah, I'm satisfied, but uh, to, as a comment, no, there's no uh, complete simulation with electric field yet. And I know that uh, some people uh, I think in Bukatini's group or uh, yeah, yeah. also in the Rezolos groups are trying to do that, but I don't know, I, I, they don't have any results yet. Yeah. I mean, even the lifetime of the magnetic field is not really pinned down as far as I know. So yes. I said it short, but probably it gets frozen into the plasma and, and lives much longer. So I don't know what's, so yeah. I, there is definitely a lot of space for improvement on, on theory. and. At the Thank you. Okay, the next question is uh, Honi, please. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, so, uh, thanks for a very nice talk. It was very informative. Uh, so, I have uh, one uh, question and one comment, uh, if I may. So, my first question is uh, I'm confused with the distinction between helicity and chirality in your uh, definition, because as far as I know, uh, this uh, uh, axial charge density can be shown to be the net helicity, uh, uh, boost particle and antiparticle 
just defined by the alignment between momentum and the spin. So I'm a little bit confused why yeah. you said that helicity is different from chirality in the sense. So if you define chirality as uh, axial charge density. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my first uh, question. Yeah. My, uh, my second comment is about this, uh, this kind of uh, long lasting uh, uh, debate about uh, uh, this vanishing chiral magnet effect in equilibrium. Uh, my only comment is that uh, as, far, as far as I understand this uh, chemical concept of chemical potential is for the density matrix that, that uh, in, in say in, in, in summer equilibrium uh, because uh, chemical potential is a parameter appearing in the density matrix when we, when we, when we do this summer average and the identification of the uh, A0 with chemical potential is meaningful in that concept. Uh, yeah. uh, but on the other end, in the real time, uh, shubing or Keldish contour away from this summer circle, there is no A0, which can be identified with the mu. I, and I think maybe this is one way of understanding why we kind of uh, 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 have some uh, confusions whether it vanishes uh, or not. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, I, so in my opinion, uh, it is true that if we really compute the expectation value of current in the summer circle, like Euclidean average, then there is uh, identification of A0 with mu and then CME must vanish there, I agree. Mm -hmm. But if you compute that in the real time in Schubing or Keldish, like, like saying computing the retarded green functions there, uh, like JJ correlator, and then identify mm -hmm. chiral magnetic current from that real time contour, I'm not completely sure that we have the second term you mentioned from A0, yeah. because there's yeah. no A0 there. So, so yeah, so that's my uh, comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so let me first, um, uh, this helicity versus chirality issue. Um, so it's true that chirality is basically helicity, but only for massless fermions, right? So for massless fermions, that's true. If you have uh, massive fermions, you can still define uh, chirality and helicity, but they don't coincide anymore. So it's, then it's different. So, oh, I and see. you can define, so, yeah. Yes, so for so massive general, fermions, massive, yes, maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I see. So, yeah. so they're slightly different concepts. And conceptually for me, I don't know if it's true, but I thought a little bit about this also. Uh, Okay, thanks. So also because of this, of the concept of helicity in, 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 in optics versus the concept of chirality. So helicity, again, if you talk about optical helicity or magnetic helicity, these are never gauge invariant quantities. So they are not really defined. You cannot locally say there's that much helicity here. But you want, eventually, if you have like small chiral molecules and you want to see how radiation, electromagnetic radiation, interacts with tiny little uh, molecules, then you need a local concept of felicity, and that's this silch, and that's it. Uh, right. In the context of fermions, uh, you could use the Dirac equation for massless particles and kind of see that they are directly proportional, at least for the fermions. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have another question. Uh, 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 yeah, there was also the com okay, the I agree with the comment. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I, I sort of jumped a bit too quickly. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, next question by uh, Sasa Grosdano, please. Um, hey, Carl. Um, thanks Hi. for the talk. Uh, I, have a, I have a question. So, how much do we really know about all of these various effects in the presence of dynamical magnetic field? Can you maybe comment a bit more in more detail on this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is something I did not go into. How much do we really know about when the, when the electromagnetic field is dynamical? Good. Uh, what we know is that there is an instability, chiral magnetic instability, so which converts uh, chirality, fermionic chirality, into <coughs> sorry, <coughs> into helicity of uh, electromagnetic field. So there is this conversion. So uh, the many simulations, many people looked at this. Um, if we start out with uh, fermions at some chemical potential, chiral chemical potential, couple it to, to a Maxwell uh, gauge field, then the uh, fermion chirality gets uh, converted into uh, helicity. 
So people are trying to use this, for example, to, to explain uh, the comparatively large magnetic fields on intergalactic distances in the, in the universe. Um, so um, that's about as much as I know. So does this answer the question to you? Yes, yeah. yeah, okay, okay. thanks. Okay, uh, anybody else, questions? Well, using this moment, let me ask my question. I actually uh, was wondering when you were showing the simulation about the uh, onset of CME in a non-equilibrium system, yeah. it's kind of clear that you do have certain scales for the uh, time scale for establishing the actual thermal equilibrium, but this scale for the establishment of the CME was different. Is it clear exactly, qualitatively exactly. what is physics that sets that scale? What is happening? What's the estimate for that in a realistic system? Okay, uh, that's, that's, that's a difficult question. So a very interesting one. Um, but I, 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 I have to say that I cannot answer this right now. So we have done very, very simple. So uh, we have done something very, very simple, which is very, very far away from any realistic uh, modeling. We just wanted to see if it's possible to, to you know, decouple a little bit what people call hydrodynamization or equilibration and thermalization from CME signal. And here we see this, because if you look to this radio metric, the radio metric, in each instance, it just looks like a black hole in equilibrium. At each moment in time, which is V here, it just looks like a perfect black hole metric, but the CME takes its time to build up. So there's some delay. Um, now I would be hesitant to, I mean, there is this possibility that it might explain something, but I think it's way too early to, 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 uh, to make far reaching statements. I think that's, to me, that's an interesting, uh, avenue to explore further and we are, we are further working on this um, and we certainly need to understand what are the time scales, uh, what determines these time scales and what are reasonably good models or what are the parameters which we want to model which probably we can match to some experiments but we don't, we don't do this at the moment so we have very initial state of this. Well. I'm not sure I'm satisfied with that, but I okay. do understand that this is a difficult question. So thank you okay. for, for trying at least. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, Frank, uh, please, uh, uh, Francisco Pena Benitez uh, wants to ask a question. Go ahead, if you can hear us. Um, hi, Carl. Hi. hi. hi um, yeah, uh, I have a question regarding the, the, the hierarchy of uh, scales you you, mm -hmm. you mentioned when you were talking about the negative monitor resistance on the thermal transport. So basically you were assuming that uh, the electron-electron uh, time scale is like the large, uh, the largest one. Yeah. Isn't that like really like a, like a fine-tuning assumption, like, but like a real fine-tuning? Um, oh. why, I mean, actually, actually, you mentioned actually you mentioned that elect, that electrons that, that are in the lowest on the level, or I mean, or basically the electrons that are transported by the current magnetic effect, they basically don't see obstacles. But then you're assuming that that time scale associated to the relaxation of uh, of, of chirality is lower than the, than the electron electron scattering mm -hmm. time. So okay. Um... My impression from the condensed matter literature is that this is the standard uh, assumption about time scales in this in this materials. Um, uh, so, if if there is significant electron-electron interaction, right, and this electron-electron interaction, I think it's fair, it's it's safe to assume that in a crystal, in a material, electron-electron interaction would be chirally blind. It would not couple left-handed with left-handed and right-handed with right-handed, it would not care about chirality. So if there's significant electron-electron interaction, then the, uh, the energies or say the temperatures the, uh, of, of the uh, 
electrons left and right, and they would equilibrate on a fast time scale. And you would not see this, this signal of uh, enhanced thermal conductivity in a temperature gradient electron. So I think, so you can at least, that's, that's uh, consistent with this, with this uh, expectation. But say so if, if you're in this regime, in this hydrodynamic regime, I think you would not see these thermal effects by source pair temperature gradient. Okay. okay. Um, other questions? It seems that everybody is satisfied with what we have. Uh, I would like to use this opportunity to, thanks, uh, to thank again, Carl, for taking time and uh, presenting all this interesting details about the physics uh, of coral matter, the golden age of Corali. If Thank you. nobody else needs to ask anything, we will be wrapping this up. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. Be well, stay safe, healthy, and thanks everybody. Okay, thank you, bye. Bye everybody.